morning and welcome to the Mid Morning Show. My name is Mary Otsuero. Uh, first of all, let me just ap- apologize uh, for what just happened. Uh, it was some kind of te- uh, small technical issue, but now it's sorted. So we're so sorry. Uh, that one will not happen next time. Yes, so it's still a good Thursday morning. I hope you're having a wonderful morning wherever you are. Uh, I hope your morning is fantastic. Today is a throwback Thursday. Tunakumbuka ya Leo Peter. Uh, remembering what our ancestors did. I'm, I'm trying to uh, remember what happened in agriculture maybe in the past. Mm-hmm. Just the song that I had mentioned before. Uh, ile ya kamata jembe na panga tuende shamba. I told you I have a terrible voice. Yes. So I think that is another activity that maybe the big body show we can celebrate because back then there was a song. Uh, I think it was rumba. I don't know if it was rumba. I don't know. I'm not sure uh, what genre it, it was, but it had that uh, that kind line. Ya kamata jembe na panga tuende shamba. Uh, the the people in the past didn't encourage laziness. They didn't encourage revival. Yes. So uh, before I tell you so many stories, I didn't even get into the topic. Uh, we are live on YouTube at a Farmers Media, on Facebook at a Farmers Media, on Twitter at a Farmers with the Z underscore Media, and on our website www.afarmers.com. Ensure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and also follow our Facebook page so that you become part of the Farmers Media family. This is a Farmers Media where we connect, learn, and grow. So today we have a very interesting topic. Uh, it's a challenging one. We are challenging each other with this topic. It's a new one. I believe uh, not most farmers know about whatever we are going to talk about today. So I always say that you learn from us as we learn from you. So by learning from us, definitely uh, you have to tell us in, in the comment section if I told you you've learned something. And also, if you want us to learn from you, tell us in the comment section maybe something that you know about the topic of the day uh, that you didn't clarify. Or uh, if you have any questions, you can send them uh, to our comment section. We'll be reading them and answering them as we continue. Anyway, our main topic of the day today is biological pest control. New right? It's a new topic because uh, I know most of you, most farmers did know about biological pest control. Maybe you just know the cultural, uh, tra- is there a traditional one <laughs> way of controlling pests? Yes, the cultural one, the chemi- use of chemicals. So uh, I think by the end of this topic, you'll get to know that there are biological ways of controlling pests. So I don't know what comes into your mind as a viewer when you talk about biological pest control. Uh, let me try and... Uh, bring you closer to this topic. So biological pest control is also known as biocontrol. I know most of you didn't know that. So it's just a method of managing pests using natural predators, parasites, pathogens, and competitors. And it basically aims uh, to maintain a balance between pests and their natural enemies to reduce the need for chemical pesticides. So when you when you're using the biological ways of controlling pests, you don't need these chemicals. You don't need the pesticides. It is just biological. That's why I'm saying I know most farmers have no idea about biological pest control because uh, we're just used to the chemicals. We're just used to the use of pesticides, the use of herbicides. Most of us, I'm sure they did know about the biological pest control, but why not? A farmer's media is here. The mid-morning show is here to educate you about the biological pest control. So let's just move to the first subtopic of introduction of natural enemies. So, beneficial organisms are introduced into the environment to target specific pests. Like, for example, ladybugs, also known as ladybird bees, uh, are introduced to control African populations in gardens and agricultural fields. So, uh, ladybird bees. Ladybug beetles uh, can be introduced to control like the aphid population. If at all you don't know what uh, an aphid is, an aphid is basically uh, they are basically small insects that feed uh, on the sap of plants. These uh, aphids, they, they're just those small insects. And uh, maybe you've met them in your farm. Maybe you've seen them maybe even on documentaries, or you've seen them physically in different farms. So they are those small insects that feed out the stuff of the plants. They can cause damage to plants 
by weakening them and transmitting diseases. Actually, this insect, these aphids, they also transmit diseases on plants. So they come in various colors uh, and they can reproduce rapidly, leading to infestations in gardens and crops. So aphids have different colors. They, they don't have that specific color. You know, these aphids are just blacks. They're just black, sorry. Insects have different colors, yes. So these aphids the, the, that are basically the small insects, they also come in different colors. So here are a few examples of the aphid species. Because af when you talk about aphids, there are different species uh, that maybe most of you didn't know about. So then we have the green heat, we have the rose aphid, we have different aphid species. So the first one, let's talk about green peach aphid. So it's a common aphid that infests a wide range of plants, including peach trees, as well as vegetables and ornamental plants. That's why it's called green peach. It mostly attacks the peach, peach plants, the peach trees, and also vegetables. So this type of uh, species of an aphid uh, can feed also uh, on vegetables and also on ornamental plants. Actually, not even feeding that now we are enjoying that aphids are not feeding on our crops. It's infesting that, that plant and it feeds, uh, it, it infests a wide range of plants, a wide range of plants, not a small range. Then we have rose aphid. So rose aphid feeds on roses and other flowering plants, causing distortion of leaves and buds. So rose aphid, basically they love flowers. I believe uh, in Kenya, the place that I know uh, mostly they grow flowers is uh, Naivasha, and uh, a place called Naivasha. I think now rose aphid can easily be found in Naivasha because they mainly love flowers. They mainly feed on roses, no specific flowers. They mainly feed on roses and flowering plants, those plants that uh, have flowers. Other plants that do not have flowers, maybe trees, maybe some kind of trees, uh, because uh, even beans have flowers, right? Yeah. So they cause distortion of leaves and also birds. Then the next one you have woolly aphid. I don't know what comes in your mind when you talk about woolly aphid. So these aphids are covered in a waxy substance that gives them a woolly appearance. I've never seen those as sheep that have excess wool, like zikopafi. They, they, they are not the wool, they're not their skin. Uh, not even that. They are wools. They are so much woolen. They are so puffy. If you've seen a cotton, a cotton plant, a cotton plant is always kind of puffy. So let's, let's just say that I can give an example of the cotton plant because these ones they love, uh, they are waxy. So they are, they are so puffy like the cotton plant. Uh, that is in appearance. They can infest apple trees and other woody plants. When you meet a, a woolly aphid, the one that is puffy, mostly they love uh, woody plants and they also love to infest apple trees. Then we have black bean aphid. So it's a pest of various leguminous plants. Uh, it, it Actually, it attacks uh, beans, it attacks peas and also other crops. That's why it's called a black bean aphid. Actually, these aphids with their names, the moment you hear the, the name of the aphid, you just know what it attacks. Like this one, the black bean aphid, definitely in, in, in attack beans. That's why it's called a black bean aphid. Then you have a cotton aphid. It feeds on cotton plants and a wide range of other crops, causing damage through sub feeding and virus transmission. By virus transmission, I just mean the disease transmission. So the cotton aphid basically feeds uh, on mainly on the cotton plant and a wide range of other crops. Aphids just attack a wide range of crops. Then we have the melon aphid, uh, a common pest of melon crops, as well as cucumbers and other cucumber plants. So the melon aphid loves uh, feeding on the melon crops, the watermelon including, included, and also the cucumbers. They also love uh, infesting the cucumbers and other cucumber plants. So those are just uh, the few examples. Uh, there are many different species, but now those are the few examples that uh, I can manage to give you today. So at least when I talk about uh, the aphid population, you know the you know whatever I'm talking about when I tell you that uh, lady lady beetles lady bird beetles are introduced to control aphid populations in gardens and agricultural fields. Now you know uh, 
what uh, an aphid is. Then our next subtopic is predators and parasitoids. So predators feed on pest species directly, while parasitoids lay their eggs or within pests. Sorry. <coughs> predators feed uh, on pest species directly, while parasitoids lay their eggs on or within pests, eventually killing them. So an example is nematodes parasitize and kill insect larva helping to control soil dwelling pests like caterpillars. So we have predators and we also have parasitoids when you talk about biological uh, pest control. So you might be thinking, what are predators? Maybe you just know the basic uh, example of predators. Uh, predators can be animals such as lions. Maybe you just know that a predator is something like a lion, a predator is something like a hawk, but you really uh, don't know uh, the explanation behind what predators are. So predators are organisms that hunt, they kill, and they feed on other organisms. Like, for example, lion. A lion hunts, right? A lion hunts. After it has hunted, it kills. When it was running after maybe a gazelle, and it catches up with the gazelle, it kills the gazelle, and then it feeds uh, also on the same same gazelle. Actually, predators, after they have killed, after they have hunted and killed, they love calling their families to come help them eat. So they play a crucial role in maintaining the balance of ecosystem by controlling populations of prey species. Predators can be animals, definitely, such as lions, wolves and also hawks uh, as well as insects like ladybugs that i've just talked about ladybug is also a, a predator and also a spider i don't know if you knew about a spider being a predator they help regulate uh, the population of their prey and contribute to the overall health and stability of an ecosystem so that is the, that is basically what a predator means they just these animals that are they will they will hunt and kill and they will eat at the end of the day whether they are eating the, the fellow animals whether they are eating other organisms these are just basically predators so predators they feed on pest species directly actually so the, where when you have a predator like a do you say maybe a hawk a hawk can just feed on your pest directly and then we we also have parasitoids uh, so. This is what I mean, I mean by parasitoids. Parasitoids, they are just a type of organism that lay their eggs on or within another host organism, usually an insect or arthropod. So a, parasit a parasitoid is basically will be an insect. So as the eggs develop, they consume the host from the inside, eventually killing it, unlike true parasites, which typically aim to keep their host alive. Parasitoids ultimately lead to the death of their hosts. That is new. Parasitoids, and like the parasites, the parasites, they try to maintain their hosts. You get it? Then, the parasitoids, they always uh, kill their hosts. They always kill their, their hosts. That is the difference between parasite and a parasitoid. A parasite will always try to maintain the host, while a parasitoid will always kill the host by feeding on it. So, parasitoids are often used as biological control against a, a, a parasitoids are often used as biological control agents in agriculture, sorry, to manage pest population. For example, uh, certain wasp species lay their eggs on pests, uh, like caterpillars. As the wasps larva grow, they feed on the caterpillar, eventually killing it and reducing the pest population. A caterpillar is also a pest, if you didn't know. A caterpillar is also a pest. So uh, when, you, when you talk about a parasitoid killing the host, a, 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 a caterpillar is also a host, can also be a host to the parasitoid. So because a parasitoid definitely kills the host, then the caterpillar will end up dying uh, at the end of the day. Uh, that is uh, after the wasp larva grow. And then after after it, they feed on the caterpillar, eventually killing it and reducing the pest population. So this natural form of pest control can be more suitable uh, and environmentally friendly than using chemical pesticides. I was saying that uh, the use of biological uh, 
the use, the, the use of biological pest control is different from this other one that we, we are using the chemicals, the pesticides, the herbicides. So that is another difference. We have examples of parasitoids, if you didn't know now, these are some of the examples. We have uh, braconid wasps. These small wasps are common parasitoids. They lay their eggs on or inside various insect hosts such as caterpillars, aphids, and beetles. Another one is uh, Ichneum wasps. So this is another group of parasitoid wasps. They lay their eggs on or in the bodies of caterpillars and other insects. I don't know if you are now spotting the difference. The braconid wasps, uh, these ones, they lay their eggs on or inside various insect hosts. While the each where the each new moon wasps are uh, they lay their eggs on or in the bodies of caterpillars and other insects. Then we have the touch me flies. So these uh, flies so these flies lay eggs on host insects. They are uh, often caterpillars or shrubs. The fly larva consume the host from the inside, eventually killing it. Then we have uh, another one is parasitic uh, nematodes. These tiny worms, like organisms, infect and parasitize insects. They release bacteria that kill the host and provide nutrients for the nematodes to develop. Another example and the final one is parasitic beetles. So some beetles lay their eggs on or in hosts, such as other beetles or insects like grasshoppers. So these are just few examples uh, of the diverse range of parasitic species that exist in nature. They are valuable natural uh, enemies of pests and insects, and they play a significant role in maintaining ecosystem balance. So that is just basically all about predators uh, and parasites. So when you just hear a uh, nematode parasite uh, is killing an insect larva, that one helps uh, to control soil wearing pests like caterpillars. We just get to understand. So that is basically all about predators and parasitoids. Then you have pathogens. So when I talk about pathogens, is what I mean. Uh, microbial pathogens such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses are used to infect and kill pests. This is so direct because uh, definitely a bacteria, a fungi, or a virus is something that uh, will affect it will affect you in one way or the other. So it can definitely kill pests. A bacteria can kill pests. A fungi can kill pests. A virus can kill pests. Just the same way viruses can kill human beings, they can affect human beings and end up killing them like uh, the COVID-19 virus, that was a virus and it was killing people. So even the viruses that can be used to kill pests, that is also another biological way of controlling pests. An example is a BT, Bacillus uh, thuringiensis, that is basically BT. It's a bacterium that produces proteins toxic to a certain to certain insects offering targeted pest control. So there are bacteria that if you use them on pests, the pest will definitely die. They, they will definitely kill the pest. The use of bacteria, the use of fungi, uh, the use of viruses, you can use the, those biological ways uh, to finish your pests. Then we have the trap crops. So specific plants are grown to attract pests away away from main crops, reducing the pest damage. An example is our mustard plants. They used to lure uh, diamond back moths away from cabbage crops. So there are also trap crops that can uh, that can trap these pests. Actually, there are plants uh, that when a pest lay, lands on them, they just cover them. So there's a specific plant. I've just forgotten the name, but next time I'll have the name. When immediately uh, an insect lands on that plant, the plant just covers the insect. I don't know if it digests it, it but it kills it at the end of the day. So we have examples of trap crops, uh, maybe that you did know, because trap, trap crops are plants strategically planted to attract pest insects away from the main crop. So the first example uh, of a trap crop uh, is mustard trap crop for aphids. So in organic farming, mustard plants can be used as trap crops to manage aphid population. So aphids are attracted to mustard plants, but they don't cause significant damage to them. So by planting a mustard near a main crop like broccoli, you can divert aphids away from the broccoli, helping to protect it from aphid infestation. So can you, can you just imagine uh, a mustard plant 
uh, is not affected by by an aphid. A mustard plant is not affected by an aphid, but the aphid is just attracted to it. Like the aphid just loves the mustard plant. And the moment that uh, aphid lands on the mustard plant, it is trapped. It will get trapped. So it's so easy when you want to protect your crops from aphids. You can easily plant a mustard, a mustard uh, plant next to your main crop. And then at the end of the day, the aphids will just be attracted to the mustard plant. And then the mustard plant will do its work to just trap the, the aphid. Then we have another one that is sunflower shrub crop for squash bugs. So, squash bugs are a common pest for plants like zucchini and pumpkins. Uh, however, they are also attracted to, to flowers. So, by planting sunflowers around the perimeter of a squash bud, patch, you can create a shrub crop that rewards the squash bugs away from the main crop, reducing the damage they cause. So, sunflowers are also uh, another type of a uh, trap crop. So when you have, uh, actually it traps mostly the squash bugs. So when you have your crops somewhere, you can plant flowers next to your crops or around that farm because uh, an insect like a squash bug will be attracted to the flower. And the moment it, uh, it gets attracted to the flower, it will not concentrate on these other crops. It will just focus on that sunflower. So sunflower trap crop is also another type of a trap crop for the squash bugs. Then we have the reddish trap crop. This one is for flea beetles. So flea beetles are known to attack plants like uh, radishes. So planting radishes alongside these crops can serve as a trap. Flea beetles are attracted to the radishes, which they prefer, allowing the main crop to grow with less pest pressure. So if you have a radish, uh, if you have a radish trap, it will be so nice to for for them to trap the flea beetles. If at all you have crops. Uh, you have crops that uh, can attract the flea beetles. The best way to trap them is planting maybe next to them now the radish trap crop. The radish crop is, is the best to trap the flea beetles. So that is the way to go when you want to trap the flea, the flea beetles. Sorry. Then uh, we have the Nastasia trap crop. This one is for white flies. I don't know if you've ever seen white flies. This one is for white flies. The nastasium shrub, shrub, shrub crop. Nastasium plants are often used as shrub crops to manage uh, white fly infestation. So white flies are drawn to nastasiums and the plants can suffer some damage. So, however, they are less damaging to uh, nastasiums than to other crops like tomatoes or cucumbers. So planting uh, nastasiums are near uh, your crops can help protect them from white fly attacks. So these white fly attacks, as much as they can, uh, they can still affect the nastasium uh, crops. It's better you just plant those nastasium crops next to maybe your plants like tomatoes, like your cucumbers. At the end of the day, these white flies they will be attracted to the nastasium crop. They will affect it, but it will not be as much as they would have affected your tomatoes or your cucumbers. That's why you, your advice are to use the nastasium crop as a trap crop when you are planting something like tomatoes or even cucumbers. So these are just a few examples of how sharp crops uh, can be strategically used to manage pests, uh, pest population in a sustainable and environmentally, environmentally friendly way. So those are some of the examples of the sharp crops. If at all you need to know about the trap crops, now at least you know that we have the uh, mustard trap crop, we have the sunflower trap crop, we have the reddish trap crop, and we also have the nastasium trap crop. And each and every trap crop have something that they can protect. They have something that they can protect. Uh, the moment you have sunflowers around your farm, you're protecting the crops that are inside. Even if you can plant maybe tomato here, then some sunflower next to it, your your tomatoes are uh, will be well protected. The next one, uh, let's talk about uh, competition. So introducing a uh, competing species can reduce pest population by lifting uh, limiting their access to resources. An example is planting cover crops. Uh, competes with weeds for nutrients and reducing weed growth. This is also another biological way. You don't need to use pesticides, you just plant cover crops. The moment you've planted uh, cover crops, they will be competing with the weeds for nutrients and uh, 
the weights will not grow well because now it's a 50-50 sharing. The nutrients are sh- uh, the weeds have to share the nutrients with your cover crops, and now the weeds will not be healthy. Because let's just imagine cover crops are something like grass. So you planted your grass, but at the end of the day, next to your grass, weeds are coming up. The weeds they need the water, they need the nutrients. So the moment you're watering or your plants are uh, you're providing your plants with the nutrients, they have to share it 50-50. The weeds have to get half, and then your cover crops have to get half. Your grass have to get grass half. At the end of the day, uh, your weeds, they will, they, will, they will grow so well because now they have a 50-50 sharing. So they won't be so strong. So that is also a, another way of controlling your weeds. And yeah, basically controlling your weeds. The next one, you have genetic control. This one is so uh, interesting. So insects are modified genetically to reduce their ability to reproduce or survive. An example is a sterile insect technique. It involves releasing sterile male insects to mate with wild females, leading to unproductive eggs. That is interesting, right? Because just imagine, now you're just releasing a, a sterile insect uh, I don't know if uh, this, this language only mostly men are the ones who will understand. Uh, the sterile insect is uh, it's just like, uh, how do I explain it? A male insect that now uh, can't, can't help a female insect to reproduce a mature egg. Yeah, a reproductive egg. So the moment you release such an insect, such a male insect, as much as they mate with the female insects, the female insects can't be able to reproduce uh, maybe other insects, other small insects. It's so hard to explain when it comes to uh, an insect. It's easier when you talk about it, when you're talking about human beings. So as much as the uh, sterile male insects will be mating with the female ones, they will not have repro- uh, they will not re- the female one will not reproduce fertile eggs. Yes, fertile eggs. So at the end of the day, no insects. There will be no in- extra insects. We just remain with the sterile one and the female one. Uh, then, uh, when I talk about uh, genetically uh, modified insects, there is so much to discuss about the genetically modified insects. So, genetically modified insects are often referred to as the genetically modified organisms, the GMOs. Yes. Uh, there are insects that have been altered uh, using genetic engineering techniques to achieve specific functions or traits. So there are examples of genetically modified insects. The first one is uh, the sterile insect techniques. That is the first one is the mosquitoes. You can uh, you can uh, sterilize the mosquitoes. Yes. So genetically modified male mosquitoes are engineered to be sterile. I'm just thinking of a mosquito, how a, how small a mosquito is, and then it is sterilized. How, I'm just interested in knowing how this works, in just seeing those machines, in just seeing how uh, they can sterilize those small mosquitoes, and how they can differentiate between a male and a female one at the same time, and make sure that they sterilize only male. This is an interesting uh MCDs are very in- interesting and something that you'd like to see. Yeah, because who doesn't... Uh, am I the only curious one? Maybe I'm the only curious one. Let me not talk for all of us, but personally, I'm so curious. I'd really like to know how uh, they identify the male ones and then they just ensure that they just sterilize the male mosquitoes. Anyway, so when released uh, into the wild, they mate with wild Males, that is the sterilized mosquitoes, and they mate with the wild females, leading to non viable offspring. So, this technique has been proposed as a way to control mosquito populations that transmit diseases uh, like uh, malaria and also Zika virus. So, if you, if you don't want uh, to transmit malaria, if you don't want to have so many mosquitoes in your area, I think now the best way to control them is just sterilizing the main ones. Scientists should tell us more about this. I need to do more research concerning how these male mosquitoes are sterilized, how they are identified, how they only make sure that they sterilize the male ones. These are the research that they should do. And the next one, you have the diamond back moth. So diamond back moth are, are pests that damage crops like cabbage, 
broccoli and cauliflower. So genetically modified diamond are uh, diamond bark moths have been developed with a shade that makes them unable uh, to survive with a treat that makes them unable to survive without a specific diet supplement sorry so when released they mate with wild diamond bark moths and their uh, and their offspring require the supplements to survive this approach aims uh, to reduce pest population so let's talk about these diamond bark moths so these diamond bark moths they are not being sterilized. For them, they are not being sterilized. But when they are uh, released, uh, when they are released out there to mate with the female ones, uh, the results will always be those diamond back moths that need supplements. So if at all you can't provide the diet supplements to the young diamond uh, back moths, they can't survive. I don't know if you're understanding whatever I'm saying. Uh, let's assume this is a male diamond back moth. It's mating with a female diamond back moth, right? Now the results will always be another small one, another small diamond back moth. So these a uh, small one can't survive without the diet supplement. So the moment there's no diet, diet supplement, they just die. In that way, now you're reducing the population of the diamond back moth. Yes. Uh, the next one we have the pink ball one. And they have five funny names. But it's something interesting. It's something that you as a farmer would like to know. Uh, so that even you can uh, reduce the use of the pesticides, they reduce the use of the herbicides so that you start practicing these biological pest control methods. And in order for you to practice uh, these biological uh, pest control methods, definitely you have to know all these affids, you have to know all this, everything that I'm talking about so that at the back of your mind at least you have the knowledge before you venture into that, uh, into that business. Then we have the pink bollworm. So genetically modified pink bollworms have been created to combat this cotton pest. So these modified insects have a little gene that is passed on their offspring, onto their offspring, causing them to die at a young age. So by releasing, uh, by releasing these modified insects into cotton pests, the goal is to suppress pink bollworm population and protect cotton crops. So these pink bollworms, uh, they're the, the genetically modified ones, not all of them, the genetically modified pink bollworms, they are created to attack the, the cotton, uh, they are created, sorry, to combat the cotton pest. But once the genetically ones are released into the cotton pest, they just die. Yes, they just die because uh, the goal is just to suppress them. Yeah, and also control the population. And at the end of the day, even if they're released into this cotton phase, they won't be able to eat the cotton plants. They will just be dying. And at the end of the day, uh, the cotton crops are protected. And the next one, we have the olive fruit fly. The olive fruit fly is a significant pest for olive trees. Uh, the genetically modified male olive fruit flies have been developed with a self-limiting gene. So when these modified males mate with the wild females, their female offspring die before reaching adulthood. This technique helps reduce uh, olive fruit fly populations and crop damage. So it's just the same as the ones that I've mentioned before. Even this one, the genetically modified olive fruit fly, once they mate with the female, the wild female ones, and uh, they reproduce and give birth maybe to the female now, the female only fruit fly. Those ones can't survive for long. They will die along the way. That way, uh, the population of the only fruit fly is reduced. Yeah. And then uh, we have another type of mosquito. It has a very difficult name. It's Addis aegypti. Addis aegypti mosquito, they transmit diseases uh, like Zika. So genetically modified uh, and these Egypti mosquitoes have been uh, engineered to carry a self-limiting gene that is passed on to their offspring. So they have a self-limiting gene that is passed on to their offspring. The offspring is the other children now. <laughs> the other children of the mosquitoes, yes. So this gene causes female offspring to die in the larval stage, reducing mosquito population. So it's all about female, female, female. The insects, the females that they reproduce at the end of the day have to die. I don't know where the male goes. So this example showcases how genetically modified insects uh, can be designed to carry specific genetic traits that help control pest populations. So reduce disease transmission and also minimize damage to crops. So however, it's important to know that the use of GMO insects 
raise ethical, environmental, and regulatory concerns that need to be carefully considered. Yeah. So that is all uh, about the genetic control. At least now you know the genetic insects, how uh, use of the genetics and uh, the genetically modified insects can help reduce the population of insects. And at the end of the day, all your crops will always uh, be protected. Then we have the conservation of natural enemies. So maintaining habitats that support beneficial organisms can help sustain their population. When you maintain habitats that support beneficial organisms, they can uh, help uh, sustain their population. So an example is uh, preserving wildflower strips near agricultural fields. That, uh, these wildflower strips, they attack pollinators uh, that indirectly aid in pest control. So there are some, there are some examples uh, of habitats that support beneficial organisms. So one of them is wildflower meadows. So wildflower meadows provide a diverse range of flowering plants that attract pollinators. They provide a diverse range of flowering plants that we have so, so many flowering plants. So these flowering plants always attract pollinators like bees, butterflies, and also other insects. So if you didn't know, a butterfly is also a pollinator, not only bees. I know when you talk about pollinators, uh, people just think of bees. We have butterflies. Butterflies are also pollinators, and we also have other insects. So these insects, they play a crucial role in pollinating crops in native plants, contributing to biodiversity and ecosystem health. The other one, we have hedge hedgerows. So hedgerows are uh, rows of shrubs, trees, and plants that form natural boundaries between fields or properties. So they offer shelter, nesting sites, and food sources for birds, insects, and small mammals. Predatory insects like ladybugs that control this population are often found in these habitats. So we also have hedgerows. Hedgerows are those uh, trees or even shrubs that you plant maybe around your farm. Is something that is separating one one plant from the other, separating a land from the road. Those are basically the hedgerows. They are also habitats of insects. Uh, they are they're also a source of food, maybe even to birds, because there are some type of trees that birds feed on. Uh, the next one we have ponds and wetlands. These ones are also habitats. So. Ponds and wetlands provide habitats for various aquatic organisms, including beneficial insects like dragonflies and damsel flies. So these insects help control mosquito population by feeding on their larva. So you see these insects that live in water, like the dragonflies, the ones that live in aquatic areas, they easily, because now mosquitoes are, mosquitoes do they say reproduce in water. At the moment, uh, they are in water and they always uh, produce the lava. And now these dragon, these aquatic insects like the dragonflies and the dumpster flies can easily feed on the lava. In that way, there will be the reduction of population of the mosquitoes. Uh, the next one we have, so I, I hope I know you realize why ponds and wetlands are also important habitat when it comes to the reduction uh, of the pests. Biologically, that is. The next one we have woodlands. So healthy woodlands support a variety of organisms, including birds, uh, birds and insects that act as natural predators of pests. So birds and birds consume a large numbers of insects, helping to regulate their population. I don't know if you've ever seen a bat. If you've never, maybe you should Google and know how a bat looks like. It has two big eyes actually. Uh, if I think personally, I normally feel that. Uh, it looks like a cat, but at the end of the day, the only difference with a, with a bat and a cat is that it flies and it has big eyes. But the head, I think the head just looks like something like a cat. So these birds and also these birds uh, that live in the woods, because the birds and the birds mostly live in the woods, they can easily, they feed on insects. They feed on different insects. So by feeding on those insects, they're helping regulate their populations. At the end of the day, uh, the goal is to regulate population uh, of the insects biologically, regulate population of the pests biologically. So the use of these birds and uh, the birds that live in the woodland, the woodlands without the habitat, the use of these uh, birds and birds is just to feed on these insects. That way they regulate their population. Uh, the next one that we've already talked about is uh, cover crops and rotation fields. 
So agricultural practices that include cover crops and crop rotation can help create habitats for beneficial organisms. So cover crops like clover attract pollinators and improve soil health, while crop rotation are uh, disrupt pest life cycles, reducing the need for chemical pesticides. I think that one you talked about. The next one we have are uh, urban gardens and green roofs. So urban gardens and green roofs planted with diverse species provides habitats for insects, birds and small mammals. These areas can encourage beneficial insects to thrive and contribute to urban biodiversity. So uh, I think it was just last was it last week last week I was talking about urban uh, farming. Uh, this is basically uh, planting your crops, doing farming in an urban setup practicing farming in an urban center. So even uh, urban gardens and also the green roofs are also a habitat uh, for different uh, for different animals, for different insects like birds. We also have uh, birds that also live uh, in such habitats and also the small mammals, so that is also a habitat for them. So these areas are uh, encourages beneficial insects to thrive. So the moment these insects thrive, they contribute to urban biodiversity. The next one we have rock piles and branch piles. So stacks of rocks or branches can create a shelter for reptiles, amphibians, and insects that prey on pests. So these piles offer safe spaces for these organisms to hide, reproduce, and hunt. Remember I was telling you about uh, uh, animals uh, like lions, like hawks, that uh, they have a habitat but they help us reduce uh, pests and diseases, yes. So, well, some of them live in these rock piles, and some of them live in brush piles. Some of them live in rocks. I don't know if you've ever seen animals or insects that live in rocks. They are there. Uh, so those uh, organisms, they can, uh, they really help in one way or the other to regulate the population of insects because they feed on them. Uh, then you have the natural grasslands. So native grasslands support a variety of beneficial insects uh, such as ground beetles and spiders which help control pest population by feeding on them. Just another reminder, we are still live on Facebook uh, at a farmer's media, on YouTube at a farmer's media, on Twitter at a farmer's with a Z underscore media, and click on our website that is www.afarmers.com. I was just uh, talking about some of the habitats uh, that these animals are the small mammals, the amphibians, uh, the insects, some of the habitats that are uh, the animals that help control pests and diseases live in. So basically creating and uh, preserving these types of habitats can enhance the presence of beneficial organisms that contribute to ecosystem health, biodiversity, and sustainable agricultural uh, practices. Yes. The next one we have uh, monitoring and thresholds. So regular monitoring has determined if pest populations exceed uh, acceptable levels. Example is integrated pest management uses monitoring data to decide when to intervene with biocontrol measures. Uh, when you monitor, when you keep on monitoring maybe your farms, and you keep on monitoring uh, if at all they have been attacked by pests and diseases, it will be so easy to control them. You know, oh, that, this one is now too much. I now have so many pests in my farm and I need to control them in a way. So you choose, are you using the chemical way, the pesticides, the herbicides, or you're using the biological way? Because there are certain levels that are, when the press gets into your farm to a certain level, now you can't use the biological control method. You can't. The only way that can help you out is now with the chemical methods, now the use of pesticides and the use of herbicides. So by monitoring, uh, by regular monitoring, it can help you know uh, the amount of pests that are in your farm, the kind of diseases that are there, and then now you can easily choose. You can choose early enough. You can choose early enough uh, so that it's uh, pretty shade. So that it doesn't get to a point that now you cannot use the biological uh, control methods. The next one, uh, we have reduced environmental impact. So, by control, reduces the need for chemical pesticides, minimizing uh, harm to non-target organisms and ecosystems. So, by control, uh, it's basically it's like letting nature's superheroes 
to take care of pests. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. The control is just like uh, letting nature spirals take care of pests. Instead of using chemicals, we use helpful insects like ladybugs that I've talked about to eat the bad bugs that harm our plants. So this way we keep everything in balance and make sure our plants stay healthy without hurting the environment. So it's like having a natural pest control team that keeps our gardens healthy and safe. This is just basically using uh, maybe insects now, using, sorry, this is just basically using, uh, using nature superheroes to uh, control your pests. Now you don't have to use the chemicals, you just use the nature superheroes to control your pests by maybe now eating them. Yes, they just eat them, maybe just eating them. So in that way you avoid using the chemicals. Can you imagine now you're spraying the pest? The moment you're spraying them, definitely you're spraying those plants. You never know the reaction the plants will have with the chemical you've sprayed on them. As much as you may have asked and it's an expert, maybe it will not work out as your as the expert has informed you. So at the end of the day, you'll end up spraying your crops. After spraying your crops, your crops maybe may be affected. As much as the insects, the pests will die, but now your crops may be affected. So instead of using the chemicals, why don't you just go the biological way? You use the nature superheroes to eat the pests. Like the birds now, they come eat the pest, and then your your plants will be safe. Your crops will always be safe. So the next one we have a uh, long term sustainability. Let's talk about long term sustainability. So by control promotes more balanced uh, and sustainable ecosystem by relying uh, on natural processes. So while biological pest control has numerous advantages, it also requires careful consideration. Uh, it also requires careful consideration uh, of factors such as the effectiveness of natural enemies because uh, as much as it is advantageous, yes, you will not be losing your crops, your crops will not um, be burnt. There are things that you must consider. You must consider uh, the effectiveness of natural enemies, uh, potential unintended consequences, and also uh, local environmental conditions. So proper selection and implement implementation are essential uh, for successful Pest management. So, there are pest management strategies. We have pest management strategies that I'd like to talk about before I take a short commercial break. So, I'll be talking about biological control, cultural control, physical control. There, there are different, different, uh, there are different, different pest management strategies. First of all, we have the biological control. So, this is when we use helpful bugs or animals to eat the pest. And harm and not harm that plant, like releasing the ladybugs to eat up its process. At the end of the day, uh, you'll not be harming your plants. Then the next one you have cultural controls. It means changing how we take care of our plants to make them less attractive to pests, like cleaning up fallen fruit so it doesn't attract uh, insects. And insects they love the the dirty, dirty fruits. So at the end of the day, when you're cleaning up the fallen fruit, it will not attract the insects. Uh, the next one is physical control. Using physical barriers or traps to keep pests away from plants. So like putting a net over strawberries to stop birds from eating them. There's also another way that uh, I realized, because uh, another type of pest is also like a monkey. So I just noticed, uh, apart from the monkeys from my place, because monkeys from my place, I think they are wiser, uh, you can take maybe a a bag, uh, a gunia, let me say something like a size of bag, and then you cover uh, bananas with it. After you've covered the bananas, they believe, farmers believe that after you've covered that type of fruit, those pests, they will just be looking from afar and they feel that uh, the fruit is not yet out, the fruit is not yet ripe. So that is a way uh, of controlling also pests biologically, just putting a net over maybe a fruit, like strawberries, uh, the birds will not be seeing the strawberries out. They just think that the strawberries are not ready and they'll not eat them. Then we have the chemical control. This is using safe chemicals to kill pests. It's important to use them carefully so that they don't harm other creatures or the environment. 
The next one is genetic control. Scientists can change the genes of pests to make them weaker or unable to reproduce. This helps uh, reduce their numbers. I already talked about that. Then finally, uh, we have integrated pest management. That is IPM. So this is like using a combination of all these strategies together. We try different methods to keep pests in check while protecting plants and the environment. So those are different strategies uh, that you can use to manage uh, pests that is biologically. So at this point, uh, we're going to take a short commercial break, but remember, we're still live on YouTube at Farmers Media, on Facebook at Farmers Media, on Twitter at Farmers with the Z underscore media, and on our website www.afarmers.com. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with the rest uh, of the subtopics. Drip irrigation is a type of micro-irrigation system that has potential to save water and nutrients by allowing water to drip slowly to the roots of the plants, either from above the soil surface or buried below the surface. The goal is to place water directly into the root zone and minimize evaporation. This system is very efficient because it delivers water directly to the plant roots reducing water waste. It's often used in arid regions or during periods of water shortage, but it's also used in more temperate climates for its efficient and conservation benefits. Common uses include vegetable gardens, flower beds, trees, shrubs, and agroforests. It can be set up for both small-scale home gardens and large-scale agricultural operations. The system requires a water source, a method to distribute the water, usually tubes and hoses, and emitters which control the amount of water delivered. Welcome back to the mid-morning show. My name is Mary Oswero and this is the Farmers Media where we connect, learn and grow. Before we went for a break, we were talking about the biological pest control methods and uh, I think I've tackled some of the subtopics and uh, from the subtopics that I've already tackled, definitely you can already feel encouraged uh, that you should just leave the chemical way, leave the pesticides and go the biological way. Anyway, we are still live on YouTube at a farmer's media, on Facebook at a farmer's media, on Twitter at a farmers with the Z underscore media and on our website www.afarmers.com. Ensure you subscribe please to our YouTube channel and also follow our Facebook page so that you become part of the a farmers media family. Also, uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, send them on our comment section. We are here to answer all of them. Uh, I'll be reading the, all of them and answering where I can and if at all, uh, 
there's some places that I'm not able to answer. We try our best. Maybe if we don't answer you with our a farmers media page down there, we we'll bring an expert next time. So we are still talking about the biological uh, pest control methods, uh, and we are still discussing some other points that you can use uh, to control uh, pest using the biological method. So another one, uh, another subtopic is integration with other methods. This is basically uh, combining beneficial insects with other pest management strategies such as cultural practices and resistant crop variety. An example is just planting re pest resistant crops and releasing uh, predatory insects uh, can offer multi-layered protection. So uh, we... If at all you don't know the beneficial insects, I'm about to tell you more about the beneficial insects because uh, maybe I can be telling you to combine the beneficial insects uh, and you have no idea what a beneficial insect is. So uh, these are some of the examples uh, of the beneficial insects and how they are used. The first one is ladybugs. That is the ladybugs. We talked about that so much. Uh, I think it is very, very important. It's a crucial uh, it's a crucial bird when it comes now to managing the pest uh, the biological way. So ladybugs eat aphids. I already mentioned that. They eat mice and other small pests that harm plants. They are often released in gardens and farms to control pest population. This is how uh, I think I've already uh, explained about the ladybugs before. Then we have a parasitoid wasp. So these were wasp lay eggs on or inside pests like caterpillars. So when the wasp larva hatch, they consume the pest from the inside, helping to reduce the number. That is also a, that is also another type of beneficial insect. Then we have the hoover flies. Uh, so hoover flies also called flower flies. So they feed on nectar and pollen. So their larva eat aphids and other small insects. They are pollinators as well as pest control. So the hoover flies, they do two jobs. They are pollinators. Uh, and they also help in controlling the pests. Yes, uh, they are pest controllers and they are pollinators. So hover flies, we have to benefit. If you know a hover fly, you know how it looks like. Uh, at least you know that that hover fly, they, they have two uh, important, crucial roles that they can play in your farm. Then you have the praying mantis. So praying mantis feed on a variety of insects, including harmful ones like caterpillar and grasshopper. So they're used in gardens to naturally manage pest populations. It's so funny that, uh, I don't know whether it's just in my place, but I hear people saying that when a praying mantis visits your place, the moment you see that praying mantis in your house, it like your, I guess it's coming to visit you soon. You're having a visitor soon. <laughs> that is a myth. I think it's a myth. Uh, I don't know if it works, or um, it's just our imagination because uh, it's something that I've seen. I've been my dudes once visited our house, and then now uh, my, our neighbor was telling us that you guys must be having a visitor today. And funny enough, the visitor showed up, so I don't know if it was, it's just something that is in our mentality or it's true. Uh, so, praying mantis are uh, they also feed on insects. Uh, they also feed on insects and they feed on the harmful insects like the caterpillars. You know how caterpillars can be harmful, by the way. A caterpillar, yeah, personally, I don't love the crawling animals. So even a caterpillar scares me. But uh, it can harm in a way in that when a caterpillar crawls on you, it leaves those, you see those two manuals that they have, it leaves them on your skin. So, and that one is so scary. So the praying mantis can feed on caterpillars. Then we have the predatory beetles, that is like the ground beetles and also the rock beetles. So these beetles eat pests like plants, snails and insect eggs. They help uh, keep gardens and fields healthy. So these predatory beetles, they can easily even eat the snails and the slugs. Uh, the snails and the slugs mostly attack the vegetables. You, you mostly find snails and slugs on the leaves of your vegetables. Then you have the nematodes. These ones are really talked about it. Uh, these are tiny worms, like uh, tiny worms that parasitize and kill insect pests uh, like grubs and larvae. So they are used as a biological control method by mixing them with water and applying them to the soil. You just mix them with water and then you apply them to the soil to easily kill the insects and even the pests. 
Then we have the predatory mites. Uh, these mites feed on harmful mites and other small pests. They're often used in greenhouse settings to control pest infestation. So if at all you're a greenhouse farmer and you want to control your pests biologically, these predatory mites are the best because they'd be feeding uh, on harmful mites. They feed on their fellow mites, but not the harmful ones, and they can easily help control pests in a greenhouse. This type of predatory mites can survive in a greenhouse for such a long time. Uh, then we have the green lace wings. So lace wings larva eat aphids. They also eat caterpillars and other soft-bodied insects. I don't know if caterpillars are soft-bodied anyway. So they are natural predators used for pest management. That is the green lace wing. The, the lace wing larva, they mostly eat the aphids and also the soft-bodied insects. Uh, when I talk about a soft-bodied insect, I think also a snail is a soft-bodied insect. Then we have the dragonflies, so and also the damsel flies. So adult dragonflies and damsel flies feed on flying insects like mosquitoes and flies. So their names, which live in water, is it mosquito larva. So they also have two functions. Their names live in water. So the names that live in water can easily eat uh, the mosquito larva. But at the same time, these dragonflies that are flying outside, they can eat. The flying are uh, insects. They are flying, but they are also attacking the flying insects. They are attacking themselves in the same in their same habitat. Then you have the beneficial nematodes. So different uh, from they are different from harmful ones. These nematodes infect and kill insects insects pests in the soil like grubs and larva. So using these beneficial insects as part of the of integrated pest management helps reduce the need for chemical pesticides and maintains a healthier uh, ecosystem in gardens and farms and other landscapes. So those are basically the those are basically the beneficial insects that uh, you can use when it comes to controlling pests uh, in your farms that is biologically controlling pests biologically. Then the next one you have commercial production and availability. So many beneficial insects are mass produced for commercial sale, ensuring a steady supply for pest control product programs. An example is aphid eating hoverflies are reared uh, and sold to farmers as part of integrated pest management strategies. So actually there are there are those insects uh, that are produced uh, Mostly the beneficial uh, insects, they are produced in large numbers because uh, you want to sell them. So many people would like to have such insects so that at the end of the day uh, it can help control uh, the pests in your farm. So, so many people would like to, so many people would like to buy them. So, uh, you can get that they are produced in large quantities so that they can be taken maybe to the market so that people can buy them. I know it's here that people will be buying insects. Uh, but in countries like Nigeria, Ghana, when you look at their markets, you realize that there are so, so many insects in those markets. Even in Uganda, it's only in Kenya that I only see termites. Yeah, in Kenya you only see termites being sold, but not all the time also. They only sell uh, the termites during their seasons. But when you when you visit like countries like Nigeria, even if you watch their movies, when you watch their markets, those who do documentaries uh, of the Ghana markets, of the Nigerian markets, you realize that those people, they, they eat those insects. There are so, so many insects uh, in their farms. So don't be surprised when I say that uh, those insects are produced for sale for commercial purposes. Uh, insects like the hover, the hover flies, because uh, they are reared and sold to farmers, so that the farmers can use them uh, for integrated pest management. The next one we have the local adaptation. So selecting beneficial insects that are well adapted to the local climate and conditions for more effective pest control. You have to select beneficial insects that can survive, that can adapt to the local climate and conditions. Uh, an example is choosing uh, predatory beetles that are native to the region uh, to control specific pests. You don't just pick any type of pest that you know you want to put it in your farm to control your farm. Maybe it has not adapted to that climate and it will end up dying before even it helps you. So it's better to choose a specific insect that can easily adapt to the climatic conditions of your region. It can easily adapt to the climatic conditions of your region and can easily help when it comes to controlling the pest in your farm.
Uh, then we have monitoring tools and technology. I always say that each and every time we have a topic, we have to talk about technology because now we are in a new generation, ESI generation C. So they just reason with technology. Minus technology, they can't understand anything. Uh, in this generation, we mostly believe uh, in the new technology. So, uh, utilizing tools such as uh, pheromone traps and sticky cards to monitor pest and beneficial insect population. You can even utilize tools such as the pheromone traps uh, and sticky cards to monitor the pest and beneficial insect population. An example is uh, the pheromone traps helps track moth populations, allowing for timely release of parasitic wasps to control them. So not we, we don't only have the thermal traps, we also have different technological tools uh, that we can use when it comes to uh, controlling the pest in our farms. The first one is uh, sticky traps. So these are aggressive coated cards or chips placed near plants. So insects get stuck to them, helping identify which pests are present and their numbers. So once you stick this, this sticky trap, these coated cards next to your, maybe your coriander leaves. The insects will just be flying and uh, sticking on that card. At the end of the day, it will just be your work to come. Uh, check it. No, because there are some insects that you can't look with the naked eye. So I don't know if you use the microscope to see them better, but you definitely find them stuck on that card. So you know how many are there. What, what type of insect is in your plant and how you can easily control it. Then we have the yellow pants or bowls. So filled with soapy water, these bright colored containers attract and drown insects. So they provide an idea of the insect population in the area. This is interesting. Uh, when you have the yellow uh, pants or even bowls, you can just fill them with sticky water and then put them in your farm. You don't put one. When you put one, maybe not, not most insects will get into that water. You put several of them because at the end of the day, the insects will always be attracted uh, by the color. When they see the bright color, they get attracted and they get into it easily. So the moment they get into the uh, soapy water, they easily drown. That is also another biological way of just finishing the insects. Uh, then we have the visual inspection. So regularly checking plants for signs of pests like chewed leaves or discolored uh, foliage helps identify problems. And uh, you can just uh, check them with your bare eyes. You can just check them with your bare eyes. Uh, then the next one, uh, we have the big sheets. So placing a cloth or a sheet under a plant and gently shaking it can dislodge insects from foliage, uh, giving a clear view of what's present. Actually, uh, even the use of a, of a phone. If you have a if you have a touch screen phone, I've seen. Uh, I think I've seen a, a certain agronomist doing the same thing. He was putting uh, the phone next to the plant, then shaking the plant a little bit, and then uh, he was able to see. The type of insect that has a has a attacked the plant. Just looking at the screen of the phone and then seeing the insect walking. So I think that is also another way. Then we have the digital camera. So photographing plants and insects can help track changes over time and provide a visual record for analysis. So the use of photography, the use of digital cameras so that you also get to know what kind uh, of insects are, are attacking your plants. You can use them maybe in future uh, to track, to know, uh, idealize that this type of insect is attacking my plant and I handle it this way. Is it still there after maybe one year, after maybe five months? You can only use the digital cameras to, uh, you can keep those photos that you've taken from the first monitoring and then you, get, you again monitor after some years. Then you have the hand lens or magnifying glass that I was talking about. These tools help you to get closer look at insects and their characteristics for identification. So once you have the insect at hand, you just uh, use the hand lens or the magnifying glass to check what kind of insect it is and how you can handle it. Uh, you can identify the characteristics maybe. That's why you can learn maybe through Google uh, or even ask experts about those insects. Then we have the weather stations. So monitoring weather conditions like temperature, humidity and wind speed can help predict pest outbreaks and beneficial insect activity. So when you have a uh, 
a weather station definitely uh you have tools that you can use to monitor the temperature the humidity and also the wind speed so through that you can easily predict if at all you can't predict by yourself an expert experts are always out there to help you predict what kind of uh pest outbreak uh, is coming and how you can handle them when they come then we have the smartphone apps so some apps provide guides for identifying insects uh, as well as tools to record and show observations uh, an example is plantix the plantix app uh, the plantix app once you take a picture of just that insect and then you post it on that app definitely you'll get to know uh, so much information concerning that insect you get to know how it attacks and how it can be controlled so that is just an example of this of our smartphone app then the next one you have sampling techniques. This involves systematically collecting insects from a defined area using strip nets, vacuum devices, or aspirators. So just collect insects from a defined area using tools because now you can't collect, you just can't collect insects with your hands. Unless it's a gra grasshopper, the way when we were young we used to go out to the field, then you try your best to catch a grasshopper. It was not easy. But at least we could catch one. So you can't lie to me that uh, you're going to catch insects with your bare hands. It's not possible. So you have to use uh, tools like the sweepers, like the vacuum devices, or even aspirators uh, to collect the insects. Uh, then we have the biological indicators. So monitoring the presence of certain beneficial insects can indicate the overall health of an ecosystem. So these tools help farmers, gardeners, and researchers keep track of insect populations, uh, assess pest levels, and make informed decisions about pest management strategies. That one, I was, uh, that one was a very interesting subtopic to handle. I hope by now you know uh, some of the tools, uh, some of the technological tools like the digital camera that you can use maybe uh, when it comes to the pest control methods. Then we have education and training. So providing training to farmers, gardeners, and agricultural uh, professionals on how to identify, deploy, and manage and manage beneficial insects is also important. An example is just workshops and educational materials uh, on integrating beneficial insects into pest management plants. You just uh, attend these workshops as a farmer if you want to know how to manage uh, or even control your pests biologically you just attend this workshop there are workshops that are always there that you can get to learn a lot from them and even uh, you can consult the agricultural professionals there are people who went to school to do agriculture don't just assume that agriculture is a dirty career a lot of people need to go to school to uh, study it there are people who did uh, agriculture as a career and they are practicing. Some of them didn't do it as a career and they are practicing. So you can consult the agricultural professionals when you want to get to learn something new concerning the pest management strategies. Then we have the economic and the environmental benefits. Reducing the costs uh, associated with chemical pesticides use and minimizing the negative environmental impact. So basically an example of this is increased biodiversity are realized resulting from the use of beneficial insect benefits the entire ecosystem. So when I talk about reducing the cost associated uh, with chemical pesticides use and minimizing the negative environmental impact. I don't know what comes into your mind, but basically, so this is what we mean. When you use a lot of chemical sprays, uh, when you use a lot of chemical sprays to kill pests uh, on plants, it can cost a lot of money uh, and harm the environment. Because now you're going to use money and you're harming the environment. You're buying the, you're buying the pesticides, spraying it on the plants, you're harming the environment and you're still spending money. But there's other ways to take care of plants and keep pests away. So instead of using so many chemicals, uh, you can use helpful insects and other natural methods to protect plants. So this can save money because you don't need to buy expensive sprays all the time. Plus, uh, it's better for the environment because uh, we are not putting we are not putting harmful chemicals into the water and also the soil and also the air. So by being kinder to nature and using uh, more natural ways to manage pests, uh, we can save money and make sure our environment stays healthy and happy. So that is basically another way uh, 
uh, the best way the best way uh, that you can explain pest management strategy now uh, because you're saving money just use insects birds now to catch the pests for you at the end of the day you're saving money because you're not using the pesticides and you're, you're not using the insecticides uh, to spray on your farm and at the end of the day you're also uh, conserving the environment you're not polluting the air you're not polluting the water and you're not also uh, polluting the soil then you have research and innovation so continuous research to identify new species of beneficial insects and improve learning techniques for optimal soil performance. So an example is just developing new methods to rear and release predator mites for controlling spider mite infestations. At the end of the day, when you do research, uh, even if you can't do research yourself, there are researchers who have already done research concerning the biological pest control methods. Make an effort of uh, going through those articles so that you get to know uh, the new species that are coming up uh, of the of the pest story, the new species of pests that are coming up, how you can handle them, how you can treat them. Yeah, so there are different uh, researchers that have done research concerning the pests and diseases that attack our plants. Then let's move to success stories and case studies. So sharing documented success stories of using beneficial insects to encourage better adoption of the practice. So uh, even in this, uh, even uh, when you check these research researchers that have already been done, you realize that they are success stories. If at all you ever done a research, there's always part a part of it that you have to uh, write a success story, something that uh, maybe was innovative, and then there's a success story out of it, or a research has it, maybe that uh, that that kind of uh, maybe product or that that thing has already been tested and it has worked. So. That is basically a success story. So sharing the documented success stories can help farmers uh, be encouraged to practice the biological pest management practices. Then we have the community collaboration. So encouraging collaboration among farmers, researchers, and communities to implement uh, pest control strategies is also very important and very crucial. Just encourage farmers to... Uh, interact with the researchers, uh, interact with other community members so that they also get to learn about the new uh, techniques uh, of managing the pest biologically, not with the use of chemicals. Then we have regulatory considerations, so adhering to regulations and guidelines when introducing uh, non-native beneficial insects prevent unintended ecological uh, disruption. So, uh, an example is ensuring that uh, introduced species do not become invasive and disrupt a native ecosystem. So as much as you're introducing a new species, you have to be so, so careful with the new species that uh, you're introducing to the environment. So I don't know what comes into your mind when I talk about adhering to regulation and guidelines while introducing the native beneficial insects. They also have disadvantages, but let me try and break it down into smaller pieces so that you get to understand. So imagine you have a puzzle. I don't know if all of us know a puzzle, but a puzzle is something like a, it's like a game. It's like a box that have a, like a, a square, a square pad that has different, different boxes in between. They're, they're mostly drawn, but at the end of the day, you have to fill it. And you have to fill that that box correctly, you have to fill that square pad correctly. So imagine you have a puzzle and each piece fits perfectly because when you play that puzzle well, each piece, each piece must always fit perfectly. So now if you try to add a new piece that doesn't really belong, it might mess up the whole picture. Let's assume that puzzle, are you tried to fix like almost each and every box? But then at the end of the day, you have something that you have a new new products that you're adding into that puzzle it will be messed up because it will not have uh, the right structure that you have that you want it to have so introducing new bugs that are helpful but not from the same place uh can be like adding the new puzzle piece so sometimes they might eat more than just pests 
They just don't focus on the best. Sometimes they might even eat uh, your vegetables, your crops at the end of the day. So this can cause a big problem in the environment. So just like we follow rules to make sure we don't mess up a person, uh, we have rules and guidelines to follow when you're bringing in new bugs. You don't just bring in new species uh, without con- putting into consideration different factors. So we want to make sure that they don't accidentally cause trouble and change things too much in the ecosystem. This helps us protect uh, the balance of nature. So when you're introducing uh, a new species into the environment, just try your best and follow instructions. Don't just do it your own way. Don't just feel that, ah, I am. I know how to do this thing. I know how to sterilize maybe a male mosquito. And I know that after that, they meet with the female one. And then at the end of the day, the lover will just die. No, you have to follow instructions and you have to consider the factors that need to be considered at the end of the day so that um, you don't end up harming even your plants. Maybe the new species that you're introducing is now the worst. It can even mess up your plants more than uh, the normal one, the normal species. So ensure that you consider all the factors are. Uh, when it comes to introducing new species, ensure that you consider all the factors before you introduce a new species into your environment. So using beneficial insect for pest control requires a comprehensive approach that considers ecological dynamics, uh, local conditions, and the specific pests targeted. So it's a sustainable and ecologically friendly method uh, that contributes to a healthier and more balanced agricultural and natural environment. Wow. So, I think we've come to the end of our topic of today. That is the biological uh, pest control methods. Uh, It's been an interesting topic. Uh, By now, now you know that you can sterilize a male mosquito and then after sterilizing it, when it mates with a female wild mosquito, the result will not last because they will die and in that way you'll be controlling uh, the pest population. So that is something new that personally uh, I'm coming out with from today's show. It's been an interesting show. Uh, it's been an uh, an educating show. At least I've got to learn something. I hope you've also learned something from wherever you are. I normally say that we are here to learn. You learn from me as I learn from you. So I hope by now at least you have something new. Uh, you know how you can control your pest biologically. If at all you are not able to catch the whole show, the show is always uh, on YouTube. You can always go back and watch our shows on YouTube. If at all uh, Kunaengine Likupita Kidogo you really wanted to watch, they are always there on YouTube. Uh, our page is a farmer's media. Also, our Facebook page is also a farmer's media. You can always go back uh, and watch all of them. Anyway, it's been an amazing show. Uh, Thank you so much, my director. I'd like to thank my director, Doty, who has enabled this show to go in and producer Mary. Uh, I really appreciate everyone who was behind the scenes. This is still a farmer's media where we connect, learn, and grow. Thank you so much for being with me up to this point. I really, really appreciate. Uh, this Thursday would not have been a success without you. This show would not have been a success without you as our viewers. So just remember that we still have uh, the Farm Drive show coming up from 3 to 5 with Yoshi and Bugwa in Bosquin. Ensure you tune in uh, so that you also get to watch their content because they also come in with new content and educate you and you also learn a lot from them. So thank you so much for uh, keeping me company up to this point. Up to this point, I've been your host, Mary Osuero. Enjoy the rest of your day.